we may have already seen the end of the Intel i9. In fact, the whole Core i brand has been retired, with new models under the Ultra 9 name due later this year. The best i9 ever, then, should be the most recent one, the i9-14900K, all 24 cores and 32 threads of it. However, as undeniably powerful as these latest i9s are, it turns out that they and the rest of the Raptor Lake family might have a couple of teeny tiny crippling design flaws, and anyone who was thinking of buying one should probably think again. The i9-12900KS has, so far, escaped the PR nightmare that's befalling its 13th and 14th gen brethren, making it possibly the last desktop CPU of its name that's actually worth buying. Twelfth gen Intel, aka Alder Lake, looked like a step in the right direction for Intel when it launched back in 2021. The i5-12400F is one of the best bang-for-buck CPUs I've seen lately, and between that and the Ryzen 5 7500F, it's a really good time to be a budget builder. The i9-12900K was the top-end model for the generation, with 8 full-performance cores built on the 10 nanometer process, the first process shrink on a desktop CPU since 2015, as well as the usual hyper-threading supplementing those 8 physical cores with a further 8 logical ones, it had another 8 low-power e-cores, an innovation for this series that does seem somewhat out of place on an enthusiast-grade overclockable CPU. The 12900KS released the year after the original Alder Lake i9, bumping up the maximum single-core boost frequency from 5.2 to 5.5 GHz, raising all-core turbo frequencies from 4.9 to 5.2 GHz, and also... Uh, no, that, that's it. There are no other differences. The PL1 power limit is allegedly unchanged from the 241 watts of its predecessor, which would imply that it will hit those higher clock speeds without using more power. But I'm afraid that's not going to be the case. In fact, as you can probably imagine, this can be a pretty hot chip. So if you don't already have an ideal cooling setup, you might not even get the full benefit of this mid-gen refresh at all. Given the recent news about 13th and 14th gen CPUs, I wouldn't blame Intel fans for considering picking up an older generation chip instead, and the 12900KS is currently the highest spec model that isn't alleged to have serious problems. So to find out if it's still worth using in 2024, I'm testing it using an MSI Z690 Torpedo motherboard, 32GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR5 6000 RAM overclocked to 6400CL32, and a Sapphire Pulse Radeon RX 7900 XT. The MSI motherboard has three power limit presets, the so-called box cooler preset, which is the CPU's factory default of 241 watts, the tower cooler preset raises the power limit to 288 watts, and the water cooling preset changes that limit to 4096 watts, which is functionally equivalent to no limit at all. In Cinebench R23, CPU package temps at the stock 241 watt limit were extremely manageable, maxing out at about 84 degrees in a room with an ambient temp somewhere around 22, and power consumption from the wall was around the 330 watt mark. All of this seems pretty pedestrian. From its reputation, I'd expected a modern i9 like this to give me a bit more trouble and on closer inspection, it's easy to see why it's so tame. The all-core boost is only maxing out at around 4.9 GHz, which is the same as the i9-12900K. The KS is supposed to boost up an extra 300 MHz, so it seems that despite that allegedly unchanged power limit, to reach those advertised frequencies, it's gonna need more power. First, I raised the limit in the BIOS to 288 watts, which had an immediate effect on the benchmark, in that it suddenly started acting like the raging hell beast I'd been led to expect. Temps now frequently hit the high 90s and past 100 on occasion, lifting the Cinebench score by about 3% in the process. However, even when the cores weren't thermal throttling, they were still only reaching 5.1 GHz, 
to get that last 100 megahertz, I needed even more power. That just left the water cooling setting, which this time didn't have a positive effect at all. The clocks and temps looked much the same, which shouldn't be surprising as at both the 288 watt and unlimited presets, it only used about 275 watts of actual power, and the Cinebench score actually dropped slightly. I tried adding some undervolting, and with a minus 50 offset, the benchmark hit its maximum result of 28795, but was still running scarily hot. At 241 watts with the same minus 50 offset, temps were back into the low to mid 80s, but the Cinebench score dropped by about a thousand points, and once again we're only hitting 4.9 GHz. If the 12900KS has a reason to exist, I wasn't going to find it under an air cooler, so I threw money at the problem and got myself an Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 280mm all-in-one. I'd like to say the AIO made a big difference, but I'm not a liar. With the power limit maxed out without the undervolt, the CPU behaved basically the same as it did with the air cooler. The clocks occasionally hit 5.2, but more often hung around the 5.1 mark, and the only major notable difference is that the max temp is only just over 90 degrees as opposed to the 100 plus of the air cooler. I tried applying the minus 50 offset to the CPU voltage, but the system crashed 6 minutes into the benchmark. Dropping the offset to 25 resulted in reaching the 5.2 target on all cores, so when Intel published the specs for this CPU, I guess this is what they intended. As a result of all this testing, I decided to run the benchmark with two setups. The air cooler was tested with the PL set to 241 watts, and the AIO with the PL maxed out, and both coolers were tested with a minus 25 voltage offset. For context, the result in Cinebench with the AIO is the highest I've seen from any CPU so far, with the air results coming in a few points behind my next best result, the Ryzen 9 7900X 3D. The air cooler test saw Geekbench 6 hit almost 18,400 points in multi-core and over 3,000 in single core. The AIO results saw a 300 point rise in multi, which is less than 2%, and the single core results fell by a few points. Basically it's pretty much a wash, and both fall a small way behind the Ryzen 9. Interestingly however, the 12900KS holds a healthy lead over the Ryzen in the Geekbench machine learning test, though again, the higher limit only equates to a 3% improvement over the air cooler. TimeSpy scored 20.6k in the CPU test using the AIO, which is A, less than 500 points ahead of the air cooled result, and B, over 5000 points higher than the Ryzen 9 once more making it the highest scoring chip I've ever got my hands on. Which, as I mainly test second-hand and budget stuff as well as mini PCs, might not be saying all that much, but I'm still impressed. Meanwhile, Firestrike reaches 44.6k with the higher PL, and that's actually a marked improvement over the stock result for once. Productivity-wise, the KS doesn't really make a case for itself over its predecessor. In Blender, the i9 can finish the classroom test in a phenomenal 3 minutes 29 at 241 watts, and raising the power limit only shaves off 6 seconds or so. This is still a few seconds behind the Ryzen 9, but almost 3 minutes faster than an 8-core Ryzen 7 from the Zen 3 generation, which would have been contemporary to the 12th gen Intels. As for DaVinci Resolve, the H.264 test, using only the CPU for rendering, can complete a 5 minute 4K render in 7 minutes 36 at 241 watts, and 7 minutes 32 maxed out. The Ryzen 9 is only 3 seconds faster than this. On to gaming, and I couldn't really get a meaningful comparison between PLs in Valorant, as different maps give different results. Either way, the i9 manages to run in excess of 500 FPS, which is of course massive overkill for most gamers, but also still a long way behind the best Ryzens out there today, and really only on par with Zen 3 chips. 
Counter-Strike 2 allows for map selection, so it's possible to get a reasonable idea of what effect the higher power limit has on performance. And it's actually pretty significant. At stock, the i9 manages about 315 FPS, whereas the higher power limit seems to boost that by almost 10%. It's still a small amount behind the more recent Zen 4 chips I've tested, but still not too shabby. Warzone averages 218 FPS at the max power setting, putting it only 5% or so behind the Ryzen 9 7900X 3D and a whopping 50% above some of the Ryzen 5000 chips that were around at the time the 12th gen released. Unfortunately, while I tried to keep consistent test gameplay, I couldn't get comparative data between the two PL settings that made any sense, so the stock result is actually a couple of frames higher. Starfield showed almost no difference in average FPS between the air cooler and the liquid cooler results, with both coming in between 122 and 123 FPS on average. The higher power limit did seem to help with 1% lows a little, but um, I'm burying the lead here. This is the highest result I've ever seen in Starfield by a big freaking margin. The Ryzen 9 only just passed 100 FPS, which for a chip with 128 megs of L3 cache should be disappointing. However, this is just one of those games that prefers Intel to AMD. The picture is quite similar in Cyberpunk. In rasterized rendering, the higher power limit maintains higher clock speeds for longer, which primarily seems to benefit 1% and 0.1% lows. In both cases, the i9 beats the 7900X 3D, but this time only by single digits. With RT enabled, I actually saw slightly higher numbers from the Ryzen, but only by a two-frame margin. The Last of Us, on the other hand, wasn't a great result for the i9 in any configuration. In fact, it just plain doesn't seem to like Intel's as much as AMD's, and the best it could achieve was a 122 FPS average. Behind virtually every Zen 4 chip I've tested, including the Ryzen 5 7500F. Returning to the unoptimized category of games, Jedi Survivor is as smooth as buttered sandpaper. The average frame rate is a very flattering 164 FPS, but 1% lows are a paltry 66 and 0.1s fall to 42. I've yet to test the 7900X 3D here, but the Ryzen 5 7500F is only 14 frames or so behind the i9 and its 1% lows were actually a little higher. Finally, Dragon's Dogma 2 is as disappointing as usual. Even this 5 GHz 16 core monster CPU with 24 threads and 30 megs of L3 cache, with fast low latency RAM and no GPU bottleneck, can't even hit 90 FPS. And while the stuttering is maybe slightly better than I've seen elsewhere, it's still far too present for my liking. It's arguable that the i9-12900KS, as well as its non-S sibling, don't really count as i9s anymore. The new models have more cache and more e-cores than the 12th gen, so these Alder Lake chips should more accurately be compared to the Raptor Lake i7s. But those 13th and 14th gen chips are all looking like particularly risky propositions in 2024, and we're still probably a few months away from Desktop Arrow Lake. Naturally, the correct answer is to look at Zen 4, or to hold on for the impending Zen 5 release. But if you're still somehow on Team Blue and are looking for a high-performance CPU without a reputation for catastrophic failure, 12th gen i9s aren't a bad choice even if you don't have a gigantic liquid cooler to keep temps in check. This particular SKU, however, isn't really worth the extra cost over its older brother. If you are going to go for some high-end liquid cooling anyway, you can probably get similar results from the non-S version, with just a couple of tweaks in the BIOS. And even if you do, the difference is hardly worth it. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.